When an officer went into action, he would have taken his 36, framed it against this fire, and one of these. This beautiful weapon is an officer's fighting sword. Now these would have been tailor-made for the officers when this one was made. This is about 150 years old and was actually used in action. They varied slightly, but the main pattern was the same as this because this is the naval pattern, uh, but varied in weight and size and that sort of thing. Lion's head holding a basket hilt, amateur fowling from the crown showing that it's a naval weapon. Thumb guard is hinged, so when you wear it, it doesn't stick in your sight. And on this weapon, you've got a little becket here, a little ring. This enabled the officer to put a lanyard through there and secure it to his wrist. If he was fighting with it, he didn't want it, didn't want it knocked out of his hand. Or if it was knocked out of his hand, he didn't lose contact with it. His life depends on this thing. The, this is shark skin, this white stuff here, or grey on this case, and it's bound with a copper wire. So a very fine example of an officer's fighting sword. You don't see many of these about these days. It's about two and a half inches long in the cutlass, and a fraction of the weight. Okay, as I said with this cutlass, all the weight of this weapon is in the blade. Every butcher's shop in the land's got one of these. It's a different shape to this, but it's designed to do exactly the same thing. It's for chopping meat, that's what it's designed to do. So that's why all the weight is in the blade. You can slash with it, and that's what it's for. This weapon, the weight, is all down here at this end. That enables the officer or the person using it to control it with their wrist. They can parry and fence and do all the things that swordsmen do. Okay, they've got full control over the weapon at all times. It is sharpened down the full length on that side, and here, so you can slash with it if necessary. Very fine, thin steel blade with a reinforcing bead running down the centre, as you can see. It's a very fine example, beautiful weapon. And you can fight with this for hours. You can fight with this for about five minutes. And then you'd have it, it will be unlifted. Very, very heavy weapon. Okay, that's a, the main difference between those two weapons. Mind you, a good many officers use these. They like them. Now, an officer's dress sword, this is more modern, this is about 80 years old. This is gold on brass, that was just brass. Gold on brass, this one. Made by uh, Wilkinson's. We make all naval swords today. It's a very fine example. Now, the lanyard that was tied around the wrist has turned into a nice ceremonial sword knot. This thing will cost you £100. Will cost you £100 if you want to buy one of these. A handmade. Uh, everything's got a little bit smaller. Same design, but it's got smaller. Lion's head, basket hill. Again, haven't you found anything crown? The thumb guard has turned into a lock to stop it jumping out of its scabbard. But you've still got a fine steel blade and you can still fight with this quite happily. It's got a proof marking on it showing that this is actually a sword blade and not just a bit of rubbish. It's a beautiful weapon indeed. It was beautifully engraved at one stage. Unfortunately, after 80 years of polishing and cleaning, it's uh, been polished out. But that's an officer's dress sword. Now, an officer, young lad joining the Navy today, when he passes out as a sub-lieutenant at Dartmouth, he's got to have one of these. So if you're thinking of sending your kids to Dartmouth, folks, it's set you back about £800 for these prices. It's another £100 for this bit. Okay? You can get them second hand, about 400 quid. Now a young lad joining the Navy, posh out of a nice, well-heeled family, landed gentry, joined the Navy in 1860. Uh, he would join the Navy as a wants to be an officer, age 12 to 15, he would have been put into the Navy as a midshipman. The family would have provided him with his uniform, plus one of these, because this is part of his uniform, just like the officer's dress sword is part of his. Okay, midshipman's dope, this is called. It's a very fine example. Family found anchor and crown on that side. It's a nice little safety catch on the scabbard. And it's the blade, as you can see, say, it's beautifully engraved. See that, okay, there's a sovereign cipher on that side. In this case, it's Edward VII. And we all know that's from 1901 to 1910, don't we? Of course we do. Now, the engraving on this plate would have been the same as what would have been on that dress sword, which I've just shown you. And this one's been restored, so all the engraving you can see it easily. On that side, the Admiralty foul anchor, showing it once again, this is an Admiralty blade. Okay, it's a very fine example of a midshipman dirt. You can imagine a young lad at 12 in Fratton Park on the terraces of one thing, they make a few people's eyes water. So, midshipman's dirt, thing of the past now. I spent 22 years in the Royal Navy and I never ever saw one of these. And I only ever met two midshipmen. 
Nope. I think they must be a dying breed. The only other weapons in the Navy, or in the ship, that we had were the boarding pikes, which you saw as you come over the gangway. Nice long spears, 12 foot long now, with, and they had 18 foot ones as well. Nice thin triangular points. Now the reason for that, is the reason for everything on here, if the enemy was going to board the vessel, they would have come over in droves, not just ones or twos. And the idea was, you can stick one of them in, you can pull it out easy. So you can get as many as you can. Stay sticking this in someone, because you've got to turn it to pull it out. Why are you doing that? You're dead. Someone's killed you. So, and the idea, the reason for the design of all these weapons, is to enable you to do it to them before they do it to you. Okay? Here ends the lesson, folks. <laughs> Don't anyone want to fight us? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well.